Okay, so let's just talk about some of the obstacles at play or issues um, that can happen when drafting an estate plan, really for anybody, but um, these issues can particularly come up with, uh, come up for um, unmarried couples. First, the IRS. Um, oftentimes, um, as I may have mentioned before, there are, um, unlike for uh, married couples, there is no unlimited marital deduction. Married couples can transfer assets back and forth to each other as much as they want for any amount without ever having to file a <clears throat> gift tax return. For unmarried couples, that's not the case. Um, same for registered domestic partners. Um, couples um, who are unmarried, if they transfer assets to each other above the annual exemption amount, which is currently $16,000, um, then they should file a gift tax return. Um, anything over the um, credit, the estate tax credit, which is currently $12 million, um, would, would trigger a gift tax which is very unlikely. Most of us are never ever up until 2025 when this legislation is scheduled to change. Um, up until that point, most of us are never gonna pass down $12 million or gift $12 million to anybody. But it's one of those things I'm always kind of um, have in the back of my head when dealing with couples. Um, and it's basically because people frequently, um, they transfer assets to each other or to gift or gift assets to friends, family without really a second thought about it, but it can be considered a gift. The county assessor's office, I'm all, also always thinking about running through the analysis of whether there will be a reassessment. Um, we'll talk about assessment in a, in a bit, but um, you know, if, the, if you have owned property for a long time, it's definitely possible that you are paying um, property tax at a value much less than the market rate. So the last thing we want to do is trigger a reassessment. There are all kinds of exemptions and complicated analysis um, about uh, whether an assessment needs to occur. And dealing with um, unmarried couples, I'm always thinking about this um, because it could trigger a reassessment to trans if you transfer um, property, um, real property amongst unmarried couples relatives. Okay, when you have unmarried couples, it's possible that relatives may not approve of the relationship. Um, so when I'm dealing with any, any uh, um, estate plan, I'm thinking about this in the back of my head is are there going to be any challenges? This is particularly true of unmarried couples. Um, it's because um, there's a phrase that's thrown around in estate planning. It's um, the natural object of one's bounty um, that refers to where the asset is going to go. And in test date laws, say the natural um, object of your bounty will be your blood relatives or your spouse. So if you think about it, it's kind of running against the typical grain to um, transfer assets, I'm sorry, to leave assets to um, an unmarried partner. So I'm particularly thinking about this issue. Unmarried couples, okay. There are 8.07 million unmarried couples living together as of 2016. More than 62% of those um, unmarried couples have children together. Um, there is also a growing number of people over the age of 45 who are um, unmarried uh, life partners. So obviously there are some reasons behind this shift um, over you know, decades of our culture. Um, and there are some reasons for couples determining that they don't wanna get um, officially married. First, they maybe don't want the government involved in their business. They want to maintain kind of an informal partnership um, because they don't want to go through, essentially when you get married, third party in your marriage is the state. <laughs> so perhaps, and there are, you know, rules and um, obligations that come along with that. So um, couples sometimes opt out of it just on that basis. Next, and I see this really often, is couples consider um, the time 
prior to marriage and living together as kind of a trial period. They're trying out the relationship to see how they get along while living together and dealing with, you know, life together as an unmarried couple prior to getting married. Um, next, we have people who have perhaps been in uh, marriages previously, and they're maybe a little gun shy about getting married. Um, next, sometimes people don't want to take on the joint um, liability of their partner's death or tax liability. You know, when you get married, um, it's possible to experience uh, the marriage penalty when filing um, when filing income tax returns. So, what? But what needs to be established here for an unmarried couple is, um, and it, what unmarried couples need to be counseled about is that without an estate plan, intestate laws are going to control. Um, so that could have some really uh, some consequences that are inconsistent with what the person really wishes. So unless they take this act of drafting up an estate plan, intestate laws are going to control. Intestate laws um, in the state say that, uh, I'm going to use myself as an example. Um, if I pass away, uh, my husband is uh, the person who would um, receive my assets. Um, if we pass away together, it would be our son. If um, my husband, myself, and our my our son took uh, um, all passed away at the same time, then my parents would get my half, and Chris's parents would get the other half. So, and then it goes down to siblings, and then out from there. So you can see that um, without an estate plan in place, um, intestate laws can really kind of run amok if um, someone is in a lifetime partnership without being married. Just some basics to consider is um, they there need to be separate estate plans, um, separate wills, separate powers of attorney is standard. Um, if you're married um, because of that unlimited uh, marital um, transfer tax, um, you can transfer assets to your spouse without any tax consequences. For unmarried couples, that's not the case. So there need to be separate trusts set up. Also, uh, I counsel that um, I represent unmarried couples <coughs> separately. So I have a separate set of, <coughs> excuse me, retainer documents for one client and next for the other. And I tell them that I really want to meet with them separately because um, my uh, practice involves instead of, I don't really use um, uh, um, any um, worksheets or questionnaires, excuse me, for my estate planning clients, I meet with them several times throughout the process. Um, and during those meetings, I really just want to meet with the client. <clears throat> I don't really want anyone else there who's not involved in the pro who's not, you know, a, a spouse. So, um, so I always advise my clients that if they really insist upon having someone there who is not their spouse, um, that it might break attorney client privilege and confidentiality. Um, so I suggest we always meet separately. Um, this is particularly true for unmarried couples. I'm always trying to look out for um, whether there's any issue with um, um, undue influence, that sort of thing. So I really like to meet with them separately, get a sense for their personality, what their relationship dynamic is like. Um, we're just kind of looking for red flags. Okay, registered domestic partners. It's very hard to discuss um, estate planning for unmarried couples without diving into the concept of registered domestic partners. Registered domestic partners is a new status. Um, it is really um, was created for the purpose of allowing unmarried couples to create and manage property rights together during their partnership. Um, previously, it was for um, a limited number, like a limited class of people, which included same sex couples and also um, couples over the age of, I believe it was 62. As of 2019, that law has changed. It is now expanded to include everybody. So um, there are no more age requirements um, or um, requirements of uh same-sex couples, opposite-sex couples now can be registered domestic partners. Um, the IRS, this is a really important piece here, is that it does not recognize registered domestic partnerships. So um, essentially, the IRS sees 
um, registered domestic partners as legal strangers. Uh, they cannot file joint taxes together, um, and there is no head of household status offered for registered domestic partners. Um, just a heads up there, the IRS, actually, their website is really very good, and it has some really good information um, on registered domestic partners and civil unions on their website. So the reality is major, sorry, major, marriage is generally speaking quite favored under the law and registered domestic partners are as well to some extent under California law, but not under federal law. Um, for instance, there are some benefits that spouses receive and registered domestic partners receive that unmarried unregistered partners would not receive. For instance, health insurance, um, registered domestic partners and spouses have access to their partner's um, employer-sponsored health insurance plans. Protected leave, you can take leave under the CIFRA and FIMLA laws for to take care of your spouse and registered domestic partner. The marital tax deduction, like we've talked about a few times here, um, is uh, only for spouses. A life estate trust, which is an interesting way of setting up your estate plan, sorry, setting up your trust to allow for your um, trust to um, essentially split into two um, upon your death, one being a surviving spouse's trust and the other being a, an irrevocable uh, bypass or Q-tip trust. Um, the life estate trust is there so that you can sort of um, control how your assets are um, used after your death. Um, that's not available to uh, registered domestic partners or to unmarried people. Um, standing for lawsuits, uh, a, a spouse or registered domestic partner in this state can assert a um, cause of action for wrongful death. Unmarried couples cannot. There's also uh, a preference for conservatorships to be um, when an agent is required, when a conservator is required for someone, there's a general preference for a spouse or their registered domestic partner of the conservatee. Of course, there are some legal disadvantages to getting married. Um, as I talked about a few minutes ago, it can result in higher taxes. Um, you also become responsible for debts and liabilities of your spouse during the marriage. And of course, last but not least, Divorce is never a pretty option, and it's quite expensive to go through a divorce as well as being uh, emotionally very difficult. Okay, capital gains and appreciated assets for unmarried couples um, is an issue. Um, again, unmarried couples don't get the benefits as it relates to capital gains um, that married couples do. So at death, um, our assets receive a step up in basis to the fair market value of the asset at the time of our death. This allows shelter from capital gains taxes. Um, with a community property relationship um, in the state of California and uh, for uh, spouses under federal law, um, each time one of the spouses passes away, there is a step up in basis. Um, so let's uh, say husband and wife are married, they own property together, husband passes away. Let's say the property was purchased in 1965. It was worth $300,000 then. Um, let's say husband passes away in 2000, 35 years later, let's say the property is worth $1 million. It gets a full step up to $1 million upon his death. Let's say wife passes away five years later and the property is now worth $1.5 million. The whole house gets another big step up to $1.5 million for purposes of capital gains. So she could um, transfer that home to her, her son or daughter and they could turn around and sell it and sell it at far mar fair market value and experience no capital gains. For unmarried couples, um, who own a home in joint tenancy or tenants in common, they would only get one half a step up. There is no community property um, available, right? So uh, except for registered domestic partners in the state of California, then California law says there would be a double step up. Federal law says there wouldn't be. So 
capital gains, appreciated assets. You get a huge bonus if you are an, if you are a married couple. Reassessment, as I talked about before, is also a um, very significant issue. One second, let me just take a sip of water. The county is going to reassess any real property at a new base year value when the property is subject to a change in ownership. Um, so like I talked about before, if you have a legacy owner, um, perhaps taking that couple um, I just talked about a second ago who perhaps bought the property in 1965, lived there, it was worth $300,000. They lived there till 2000 um, and um, they are basically paying property tax at the fair market value of $300,000 with a slight increase every year. If they were to sell it to uh, another um, family, the family would move in and the property would be assessed at the fair market value of a million. So there's a huge difference between paying property tax on the property worth valued at 300,000 versus a million. So the general rule is that there is an assessment. If in order for there to not be an assessment, an exception has to apply. Now there's no exception um, in the law for unmarried people. There is one for um, transfers to spouses and registered domestic partners, uh, but there are other exceptions that may apply. So this is just the general law here. Change of ownership means any transfer, of basically any interest in real property um, to another person or an entity, which includes the creation of joint tenancy, which could also include the creation of a tenants in common type situation. But there are exceptions um, and there are exceptions that are spelled out in revenue and tax code sections 62, 63, and 65. Um, and I will leave it to you to review that. It's quite technical, um, but I just wanted to point that out that these exceptions exist. And um, I wanted to show where the exception, exceptions are. Here are some commonly used exemptions from reassessment. Like I said before, transfers between spouses, transfers between domestic partners, transfers as a result of a co-tenant's death, um, and transfer to or from a revocable trust um, that is for the benefit of the transferor or the transfer spouse or registered domestic partner. Okay, so there are definitely some um, issues that uh, as a, an estate planning attorney who works with unmarried couples um, that I um, <clears throat> tend to see. First time, for the first thing I want to point out is I often have couples who are longtime unmarried couple, unmarried partners who are not registered as domestic partners. Um, they have kind of an unofficial partnership for years. Like we talked about a few minutes ago, um, couples often do this and they don't want to get married. They use that um, that uh, that time period as kind of a trial period. Um, maybe they don't understand community property laws. Maybe they um, we don't have common law marriage here either. Sometimes couples think that common law marriage applies. Um, so let's say they uh, get married after 10 years together. Let's also say during that 10 year period, they have kind of come up in their um, uh, their careers together. They have purchased maybe a home together. They've acquired assets together. Um it turns into an issue of like after they get married and that's when the community property rules kick in prior to that marriage, we have to account for those assets and who exactly owns what in those situations can actually be a puzzle that has to be unraveled. Um, I always tell them that the best case scenario is that they create a prenuptial or postnuptial agreement, depending upon the timing I speak to them. But frankly, this is not what they want to hear, and they are not interested in that option. Typically, <laughs> it's because it's you know they've they've finally found the time and energy and money to um, invest in an estate plan. The last thing they want to hear is that they have to do another equally expensive um, prenuptial or postnuptial agreement. Um, so I am sure to draft up a letter referencing that I made that advice and confirm that they are not taking it. 
Um, the other thing I suggest is when it comes to personal property, and I suppose even real property, is uh, doing, I actually wouldn't say that for, for real property, for personal property, I would say creating um, some kind of inventory showing who owns what within the house. Um, another thing that comes up is I uh, sometimes work with couples who are unmarried for a long time and then they get hitched. They go through that trial period, things go well, then they get married. And um, recently I had, I was working, I've been working with a couple who was unmarried. I drafted up estate plans for them. Their trusts are separate. Wills are of course separate. Powers of attorney are, are of course separate and they just got married. And so um, the wife came to me and she said, what do I need to do? And I said, well, let me take a look here. So the first thing I do is I review the estate plan um, and I just want to make sure that their their wishes are still consistent with what their uh, estate plan says. Are the agents consistent um, with what they want? Executors, what they want? Powers of attorney agents are, are what they want. I confirm that first. Um, and then also when they're reviewing the estate plan, I'm thinking about, hmm, is the marital deduction going to be material here? Um, the marital deduction is, again, ability to transfer um, assets to your spouse without experiencing uh, tax liability. Currently, the gift and, gift and estate tax exemption or credit is $12,060,000 per person. This means a married couple can transfer $24 million, $120,000, or 24, 120, oh my gosh, $24,120,000 um, over their lifetime to uh, um, loved ones without experiencing any estate tax. So for most of us, estate tax just is not a concern. However, that legislation is scheduled to sunset in 2025. And there's even a discussion about accelerating um, that decrease in the uh, the credit prior to that. Um, of course, nobody quite knows what that's going to be. There's a lot of theorists out there discussing what it could be. I frequently heard $6 million per person. So we will see. Um, but that still means that a uh, married couple can transfer on $12 million um, per couple um, over their lifetimes or in uh, at death. So for most people, again, the marital deduction, it's not going to be an enormous deal. However, the next thing I'm looking at is, okay, is there any reason that the um, one of the spouses might want to set up um, what's called a Q-tip or a bypass trust, which is, a, like I said a second ago, which is when the trust splits upon the death of the first spouse to die. Um, it really just allows the spouse to control assets after death. Um, there Sometimes there are concerns that um, the, the living spouse may deplete the assets or sorry, deplete the estate or trust assets um, prior to the children receiving um, the assets. Sometimes there's concern about remarriage and what that situation is going to look like. Will there be other children, et cetera? So um, having that Q-tip or bypass trust can really um, bring some security to um, someone who's concerned about that issue um, and they can sort of secure the property for their kids after they pass away. Okay, common scenario number two is um, longtime partners. Um, let's say she adds a home and she's considering just adding him to the deed. Well, if she adds him to the deed, that's considered a gift, which is we're going to require the filing of a gift tax filing. It's not just like adding someone to the deed. Um, it becomes um, a throwaway concept. It actually has consequences to it. Um, as we talked about, the annual exclusion for 2022 is $16,000. Um, and the lifetime federal gift tax credit is $12 million. So that needs to be taken into account. Um, also, will there be a re reassessment? The answer is yes, unless an exception applies. Common theory number three is the um, qualified retirement plan beneficiary designations. Um, the, this law just changed significantly in 2019. Prior to 2019, um, all beneficiaries were allowed to stretch um, any inherited IRAs over their lifetimes. Um, that's not the case any, anymore. That's only the case for designated beneficiaries. 
and not every beneficiary is a designated beneficiary. Domestic partners and life partners are not listed as designated beneficiaries, which is consistent with federal law kind of not really recognizing registered domestic partners. Um, prior to the SECURE Act, like I said, um, everyone could stretch out that, um, that retirement account. But again, this is no longer the case. Um, Non-designated beneficiaries must withdraw the inherited funds within 10 years and pay income taxes on the distributed amounts. Okay, the other big issue that comes up is the relatives, right? As we talked about a second ago, um, there can be a higher possibility of there being an unhappy relative um, if a if the mom or dad decides to name their life partner um, as the main beneficiary of their estate plan. I, I talked a second ago about the natural objects of one bount one's bounty is family, according to the law. Um, and so um, with unmarried couples, you're working a little bit against the grain of that concept. Um, so there's just more room for unhappy family members and a possibility for a trust or will challenge. So the first thing I suggest is establishing evidence of client cap uh, capacity um, at the time of execution. And then just generally speaking throughout your, your meetings with the clients, um, you want to make sure you're doing interviewing to be sure that they're um, intent is clear and that they understand um, the assets and where they'd be going if they passed away. Also keeping detailed notes. Um, I once met with a firm that did um, lawsuits, uh, represented um, disgruntled beneficiaries, and they said that often they would request a copy of the client's file from the um, estate planning attorney's office. And they said that there would hardly ever be any notes. So keep detailed notes, right, about you establishing capacity. Um, it's also possible if you really are concerned about whether the client has capacity is requesting um, a statement um, from the doctor about the capacity of the person. Next, um, considering periodic re-execution um, of the estate planning documents, it just it just shows um, that the person, the client has repeatedly expressed the same intent, that this is no accident, that this is their intention. Um, next is the Certificate of Independent Review, um, which is a great tool. It's where a third party comes in, third party attorney comes in and reviews the estate plan, talks with the client to make sure that the client fully understands the estate plan and that um, they understand their intended um, testamentary actions. They're also going to try to look for any evidence of undue influence or fraud. Also, just in general, um, having an estate plan, oops, having an estate plan just in general, like I said, is going to fix a lot of problems. Um, and one that is well drafted and thought out and comprehensive is, is, is really the way to go for unmarried couples. Oh, this is, I just put together um, some statutory language um, of what a certificate of independent review would say. It just sets out that the count, the attorney has um, met with the client, has discussed uh, the nature and consequences of the transfers, um, that they're an independent attorney, and that they have determined that there is no fraud or undue influence. So obviously that can be really handy if a trust or will is ever uh, um, brought under scrutiny. Okay, so some solutions. So as we've talked about, there are some unique issues presented by estate planning for unmarried or unregistered couples, particularly unmarried couples. Um, in that is just because, like I've talked about throughout this, the law just sort of favors married couples. And um, that's particularly true under federal law. And with because federal law is triggered by estate planning because of the gift taxes and the gift tax returns and the estate um, gift and estate tax credit, you know, there's always going to be a concern about federal law here. So first of all, having a thoughtful estate plan in place, like I've said, is really, really credit uh, <laughs> critical or intestate next of kin laws will apply. 
We want to make sure that the appropriate beneficiary designations are at play. We want to make sure that there are the appropriate agent, executor, and trustee nominations. Um, you want to do capacity checks, which was just discussed in the other slide, extensive interviewing, keeping detailed notes, um, keeping uh, receiving a statement from a doctor about the capacity of the client, um, also periodic re-review re re and re-execution and certificate of independent review. Also because um, occasionally uh, transferring um, transferring assets to a an unmarried um, uh, partner could result in reassessment of property. Um, you also may, maybe want to consider um, gifting strategies. Uh, you can transfer up to $16,000 per year and $12 million over a lifetime. Uh, now, remember that this is going to change, definitely. Um, so it's uh, if, if gifting is the game here for you, then um, it's important to act on that sooner rather than later because that is going to change. And then just having life insurance plans and private annuities set, set um, aside for um, an unmarried life partner can be really helpful because none of because those issues, those plans are not going to be affected by um, the very prevalent um, preference for married couples. And that's it for now. Um, I'm here for questions. <laughs>